Trashamaniacs. Gearheads. It's time for episode 77 of Geo Gearheads. That's double sevens. One more seven, and you'd win at slots. I'm the bad cop, back with Daryl W4 for a discussion of power caching by bicycle. But before we get to that, we have feedback from last week's randomized show. Yeah, and I heard from uh, Moby Jack, one of the developers behind the Honey Blend app we mentioned last week during the Wallaby discussion, and he had some good information and some clarifications. Some of the items are, in fact, limited to, uh, based on certain regions at launch. The burrito, or the Pinto burrito, actually, item was originally limited to being forged from Glasgow for the first month. Also, for those wondering what happens when you hit the recycle button for an item, it is randomly placed into locations around the world. I happened across uh, one forge by Moby Jack who was uh, out of Europe, and that was in my big shopping mall over here. Uh, he also uh, mentioned that the game has come a long way in its first year, and I mentioned that ability to trade and communicate through the app but apparently that's uh, fairly new, and that was not always the case. Really? See, since I just started, I assumed it had always been there. Yeah, I guess one of the advantages of uh, uh, not getting uh, uh, in on that first wave is we get uh, a little bit later on. And I know that they are planning some other things uh, in the near future. So when you recycle something, is it placed in the inventory of a, of a venue somewhere around the world? Or is it... <laughs> Place right, to be right. foraged. No, it doesn't get uh, forged again. Forging, I guess, is all new. That's uh, what okay. uh, the impression is that I've gotten from, um, mostly from him, but from some other people. It's not placed into the store. It doesn't go into the market. It doesn't go, you know, anywhere except into the inventory of certain locations to be uh, picked up or swapped out later. Okay. Well, I've been spending a lot of time in this game myself and I should warn people that it's a huge battery drain. Now I thought caching and Munzee apps were bad until I dealt with this sucker. The developers behind Wallaby are working on version 1.2 of the app which will be accompanied by new servers. Hopefully we'll see some improvement in the battery performance as well. Yeah we know many audience members have uh, signed up and checked out Wallaby and we'd love to hear from you about that or anything that we've talked about on any of these shows and you can email us at geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com or better yet call those into 206-350-3647 so we can hear those in your own voice. Well Daryl I'd love to hear from the Geo Gearheads audience on just about anything not the shows that we've already mentioned but, but upcoming ideas for shows feedback and questions we like it all. Now next week we're joined by Ricky Briganti of the Inside the Magic podcast to talk about the Disney Parks location games that's next week. And I, I'm excited about that one. Now, I know many of you have been to one of the uh, many Disney Parks, and we'd love your thoughts about the existing uh, location games they have there, like Agent P's World Showcase, A Pirate's Adventure, Treasures of the Seven Seas, or even the Mini Hoonie. Adventure Mini Trail. Hanu, I think is actually Hanu. how that's pronounced. I am so bad at Hawaiian. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have any expertise, <laughs> but I've watched enough of the videos that I think that that's how it's pronounced. Okay. Now, if you've done any of those, or you know, part of it, even seen somebody else do it, call into our voicemail line at two zero six three five zero three six four seven, or email those uh, hints, tips clues, impressions to us at uh, geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com. Now for our feature this time, we're talking about uh, using a bicycle for power caching. Now that's something very near and dear to me, and I'm pleased to welcome M-Trax to join us on the show again, but he was actually on the original Cashmaniac series, episode 87. So if you want to know a little bit about him, or, well, a little more about him, actually, uh, why don't you uh, go over and check that out? And, of course, we'll have the link in the uh, show notes. But, M-Trax, welcome to the uh, Geo Gearheads, 
And before we get into the topic, uh, why don't you let us know a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, from uh, Canberra, Australia, started in late 2006, um, uh, and uh, cache um, uh, somewhat around the Canberra region, but uh, I think uh, over about uh, just under half of my caches I've found are with in excess of 100 kilometres from uh, my home. So I do like to uh, forage uh, or cache out of town or at least uh, in uh, teams uh, on uh, weekends or uh, trips away. So uh, that's a quick summary of uh, my history, I guess. So I'm uh, currently up to or getting close to my 5,000 uh, as a few hundred finds away from that, but uh, that's my uh, latest target. Uh, excellent, and uh, congratulations on uh, making that uh, in advance, I guess, and uh, good mm. luck getting there is probably uh, more appropriate. But yep. uh, some of the uh, posts that you've had on Google Plus uh, and my previous uh, recent experiences, uh, power caching on a bicycle are kind of what led to the show, and we did talk about caching by bicycle earlier, but power caching by bicycle is a little bit different so we're going to talk more specifically about that if you want more general information go back and check out the uh, gearing your bike show and we'll link to that in the show notes as well but one of the most important things for bicycle caching and I think you actually uh, mentioned this too when I was uh, posting that I wanted some tips uh, to pass on is actually the uh, mounts on your bike for that GPSR and or smartphone. Uh, say again, the uh, the mounts for your GPSR and or smartphone. Oh, okay. Well, I, I uh, currently own a um, Oregon six hundred, so uh, touch screen at the moment. So that uh, helps uh, with the interactions on the bike, and I've uh, obviously got a bike mounted. Uh, bracket for my GPS and um, I use uh, uh, on the on the Garmin I use the the map dashboard the geocaching map dashboard which uh, helps with that workflow of uh, clicking find and then automatically navigate to the next cache without uh, too much uh, bother you know because obviously if you've got to sit around uh, tapping that screen then there's less time for caching so and uh, there's only one uh, every 160 meters away so you've got to sort of really uh, um, make it a bit more efficient I guess if you're uh, in power caching mode but um, uh, yeah so that's 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 a technique that I've, I've been using for on the on the, on the actual GPS yeah, now one of the things that uh, I like is being able to quickly remove that. So when I'm looking at the mount, I really look at how easily and how quickly can I pop that uh, GPSR or smartphone off and take it with me. Because right. if it's in the woods, you know, you know yes, a few yes. hundred or a few meters off the trail, you might actually need the help of the actual unit. And right. some of these don't come off very well. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, another thing uh, that you want to look for too is, especially for the smartphones, a case that's going to give you some weather protection. And this is where it gets a little tricky sometimes, is some of the uh, cases that do the bike mounting are very good for weather protection. However, they're not so good at coming off the handlebars. So mm, you right. might have some issues with that. Uh, there are some great ones out there. I happen to like the uh, Biologic products. Uh, which makes stuff for and for some Android phones and for the uh, iPhones. Uh, Ram Mount has some uh, great products for both GPSRs and smartphones, including some universal stuff uh, that will give you some uh, protection. And some of it's just basically a bare mount. So you, know, you can take a look at uh, what you want and uh, kind of get a happy medium uh, there between what you're willing to pay for and what you want uh, as far as protection and ease of uh, you know, undocking your device. Hmm. But, yeah, so, so I basically use the uh, just the, G, the Oregon GPS. But uh, what do you do for a battery for um, the the um, smartphones? That must hmm. be a bit of an issue, right? Uh, that was yes, my next that was question. 
that was the next thing I was going to get into is uh, uh, battery power for just about any of these things. Now, if you're really lucky, you have the uh, front wheel uh, dymo on your uh, bike to generate the power and charge up your phone. And there are some really great systems that will do, uh, you know, as you're riding, it generates a power, tops off your phone, runs your uh, lights and that kind of stuff. It, the only problem is I'm not sure I'd really want to take those on some of the uh, uh, unimproved trails. So, you know, like the mountain bike trails, I don't think I'd trust the, uh, those systems. But uh, that's one of the things that you want to look for, especially if you have those waterproof cases. They won't necessarily allow for an external power supply. And a lot of those are built for just the phone. So you don't have the option of powering it externally. You know, you yeah. can't have like a battery pack. You can't have one of the battery cases. That's pretty much it. Others are you know, not the ones you typically that will give you the weather protection, but there are some of those uh, mounts that are versatile enough that you could use just a standard uh, battery case, you know, something like the uh, Mophies or the uh, uh, power skins we've mentioned before. But I happen to like using like the Biologic and uh, uh Bad cap. I think you have the uh, life proof case for your mm -hmm. iPhone five. Exactly, and I don't. I believe they do make a bike mount for that life proof case. I haven't seen it, but uh, they, the life proof case is great. I did look I'm, for that. Okay, I'm really happy with it. It's thin. It's light. It's it's not like a a big otter box. So, yeah, and that's I, one I'm thing to uh, case. Yeah, and that's one thing to keep in mind, too, is when you do hook up those external connections, you will lose some of the uh, water protection as well. So exactly, you know, make sure that uh, you're going to keep the unit dry if that's, in fact, what you're doing with it. Yeah, that's a good point. On that life-proof case, the, uh, you can screw in a, an audio jack to be able to listen to headphones, and that'll keep it dry. But as soon as you pop open the charge port, you know, it's it's open to the element, so it's no longer completely watertight. Right. Just, just on a side note, the, the 600, which I was uh, using, uh, has um, significantly less uh, uh, battery uh, lifetime than the uh, previous models, uh, obviously because of this new screen, right? It's I found that uh, it would struggle to uh, last a whole day, uh, but uh, there, there might be uh, some adjustments. I mean, I think I had the sort of the contrast or the brightness pretty much three quarters mm -hmm. of the way up, uh, and I've been messing around with it um, recently. And I think you can survive in maybe 50% or less because the uh, the it is quite uh, you know quite a bright screen so um, surprising that you can dial that down that may improve plus I've now uh, installed some new uh, 2500 milliamp battery so that will uh, give me um, a bit of an edge over the 2000 I uh, had on there before so uh, that's just a, an observation that people might uh, want to know about the 600 it, it has uh, has some issues but um, it is uh, is an improvement, but it's uh, still not quite there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I do want to mention, too, that working with multiple, dev multiple devices can be really nice. I always love having the backup, essentially, of the two devices. I usually use the GPSR for the navigation, the smartphone for the logging to check the details. But what I found when I get out on the bike is that that can be a lot of stuff to... Uh, fumble around to maintain. Yes. Yep. So it, it can be a lot more work and you're also at risk too if you don't take like the GPS with you. It's a really quick, easy thing for someone to walk away with. You know, yes. If you're uh, or, or hiding off in the... Yeah. The more things you got, the more things you might leave. Exactly. That's <laughs> so that's something to keep in mind is it might not be such a good idea if you want to go the... Uh, uh, two device route, and I do like doing the two devices. You know, you're going to probably have your phone with you anyhow. Maybe what you do is take the phone with you as that second device into the woods, do your logging, but your GPSR is going to be your primary device for navigation. Yes. So you'll have to play with that a little bit yourself. 
and see what actually works well for you. But do keep that in mind. It's it's generally not going to work to use both devices at the same time. Right. And, of course, the GPSR is going to give you much better uh, direction and cell, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, satellite reception than the smartphone is. And you're probably going to get longer battery life out of it. Yeah, the battery life is going to be a big deal. But you know, one of the things that I noticed is uh, on the rail trail, we had a lot of interference from the uh, power lines. And the GPSRs uh, with the uh, better antennas did tend to get thrown further off than the uh, iPhone 5 did that we were using. So, you know, that's, that's another good reason to have both devices is it's... Uh, uh, kind of the benefit of averaging. Well, this this one says it's over <laughs> here. That one says it's over there. So let's check everywhere in between. And uh, it, it, it's it's rough when you have the interference of the power lines, but at least that way you have a little bit better range to work with. Now, I do want to talk about uh, supplies, of course. Uh, obviously, we've mentioned batteries. It's always a good thing to bring the spare batteries. Whenever you're power caching, try to bring some spare logs, pens, that kind of stuff. But most importantly, you want to bring things like water and snacks because if you're power caching, you're going to be out there for a while. And you want to have something that's light, quick, and easy. Of course, water is always a problem. You always need to stay hydrated. But snacks like uh, nuts are great. Uh, things like the uh, energy bars, the power bars, that kind of stuff can be uh, good ones as well. You know, light, compact, quick and easy energy. And you know, one of my favorite things for uh, uh, trail riding, believe it or not, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Lots yeah, of protein, yeah. lots of energy, and a nice little uh, package that, you know, as long as you eat it within a couple of hours, it doesn't get too bad. <laughs> and, 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 of course, it depends on the, the actual uh, track you're going on. Uh, the one I um, have done... Um, uh, last month at Windsor, um, that was obviously in an urban area. So uh, you could sort of, I mean, there was a few places you could uh, strategically stop and uh, have your uh, morning tea or whatever. So uh, uh, I think you just have to be aware of um, pinpointing those points. You know, there's obviously the uh, impetus to sort of keep on going, but you have to say, well, okay, the next uh, watering hole is. Uh, like 10 miles away, well, let's just have an early lunch rather than, uh, uh, you know, no lunch at all. So, you know, that's a factor as well. Oh, it's, no, it's no different than if you're caching by car. you got to plan for fuel stops. This is Correct. bicycle fuel. You're putting yeah, that's right. Your fuel body. for the driver. <laughs> Indeed. The Indeed. engine. <laughs> well, a couple more things that you'll probably want to look at bringing, especially when you're in a uh, group, is make sure that you'll have uh, things like the inner tubes, uh, you know, at least one for whatever size, bring uh, something. You know, I really don't like those uh, uh, little metal, metal cylinders for filling your tires. Right. And a lot of people will tell you that that actually does, you know, the uh, gases that they use in those cylinders actually can uh, destroy the rubber in the inner tubes. But for the quick shots to get you up and running and off the trail, those can be so much nicer than the little bike pumps. So bringing a, a tube, knowing how to use it, and the whole tire change kit will save your butt if you do happen to break down uh, uh, by getting a flat on the trail. Yeah, and, and straw, st the old stuffing straw in the tire trick, that doesn't work with bikes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Have you tried so, that? You're out of luck there. <laughs> uh, I haven't tried it, and I don't think I want to. No. No, yeah, uh, Allen keys is a good uh, uh, option as well, and maybe a screwdriver. You know, the smaller the better. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you don't want to load yourself up too uh, too much, really. No, and there there are some great little bike kits that anyone who's done biking for any length of time will have a nice little kit that they carry with them that has some of those basic tools in them. That's really tiny. They're not terribly easy to use, but it's lightweight. Quick, easy. If you need it, it's there. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, this all gets back to uh, planning, and we've kind of talked about uh, the planning, your stops and stuff. 
And one of the keys is getting that pocket query and doing all of your uh, uh, planning and you know scouting electronically ahead of time whenever you do these. Now remember your pocket query is limited to a thousand caches and you can either do that by caches along a route or bookmark list but you definitely want to get in there and you can do it through something like GSAC or you know use a, uh, a different filter you know even like Geosphere would uh, allow you to bring down the information and create your own uh, GPX file that you could load into a GPSR but you do want to get the number of caches down to just the ones that you're going to hit and it's especially important if you're going to be doing that find next cache so you don't try to find one that's you know like down under the uh, uh, railroad trestle that you just rode over that's completely inaccessible unless you want to go bungee jumping <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> A, a, a bit of a uh, pit for along if you're using a uh, the uh, caching along a route. If, if you're sort of um, taking the easy way and just do a straight line, and uh, later on you find your trail verges off that um, straight line, that's uh, something I've done. I've sort of uh, put my trail. You know, like I'm going from town A to town B. And then uh, didn't realize the actual trail sort of verged off left or right off the pocket query. And then all of a sudden they're saying, well, I'm sure there's caches here, but uh, my, my GPS hasn't got any. But uh, that's a, um, uh, a, a trap that you can fall in there. You've got to really um, follow the, uh, the route rather than, uh, you know, as far as a crow flies. Oh, absolutely. Sometimes you'll get lucky. The cache owner has created a bookmark list. Sometimes mm. you'll have uh, route files that other users on geocaching.com have created for those more popular bike routes. So definitely look for those before you go through the work of doing it yourself. It's going to be a lot uh, uh, better than going through all the effort. And in many cases, it's going to be more accurate, too, because someone went through and did the work of grabbing those. Exactly. Now, the problem, though, yeah. is if you have a bookmark list done by, like, the cache owner, those might not include some of the other caches along the trail. Like, if there was a uh, trailhead cache or something, you know, that might not be included because it's not part of the cache owner's series. Yeah, and uh, another th issue I seem to uh, hit up against, uh, and uh, if you, especially if you're going with uh, groups or, or a number of teams, uh, is having mutual unfounds and that's uh, sort of a, an issue really. You've got to um, try and scope out all the caches, assuming that everyone's agreed to sort of find mutual unfounds as opposed to just going, you know, to re revisiting caches, you know, uh, and, and there are tools that to do that. But um, uh, I uh, use the GSAC query this time and that seemed to be uh, not perfect but that seems to be uh, a pretty easy way of capturing um, a list of uh, geocaching names which um, haven't unfound caches and, and I guess if you go on a power trust not a big issue but usually uh, there might be some side caches that people have gotten on previous trips that uh, so you've got to sort of make that uh, you know, judgment or agreement up front to see how you're going to treat those. Right, and that also goes for things like finding the uh, uh, caches that have several DNFs and excluding right. those. If you, yeah. you know, if you're going for those power trails, you really don't want to waste the time looking for a cache that's not there. Yes, so that's yes. always mm -hmm. a good thing. And and in many cases, talk to the cache owner. They'll actually ask the people who replace the cache. And mm. in some cases, they'll even give you the replacement containers and logs and everything to take along with you. So, you know, make sure that uh, you do keep an eye on that. Talk with the cache owners. They might have the uh, uh, containers to pass on. And if you do happen across one that uh, you're sure is missing, you can go and replace it. Yep, yep. And, right. and, and swing, swinging back around the planning again, uh, and I mentioned this earlier uh, before the, uh, the show, um, it, planning how you're going to get the bikes uh, there is uh, something you have to sort of be aware of, particularly if there's multiple bikes and uh, and uh, you need either multiple cars or at least the capability of housing all those bikes on the one car. You've got to, you know, 
not assume that you can just go cram them in one car. So that's a big issue in some cases. Yeah, definitely. And one thing to also look at that might save you a whole lot of time and enable you to get a whole lot more caches is the possibility of staging a car at the far end of the trail before yeah. you start out. So like the night before someone mm -hmm. goes and drops their car at one end of the trail. You don't have to have the bike equipment on there to carry it, you know, none, none of the racks, just the car. And then you use that car to go and drive the drivers back to their cars and everyone returns with the uh, bike racks. Now, if you have yeah. the bike racks on that car, it's that much better. But it is a good way to do a uh, one-way trip and that can be worth a little bit of extra time and a mm -hmm. lot more caches. Yes, and yes. So and that's what we did in um, Victoria. We uh, fortunately uh, we dropped all the bikes at the at the start or our start, and we uh, drove to the uh, the end. And we uh, fortunately had someone who was there to um, uh, drop us off because we had some guy waiting with the bikes at the other end uh, drop us off uh, at the uh, the start, so we could effectively just ride the one way and not having to sort of that was a 20k ride, so that would have been a significant amount of time to sort of uh, double back to uh, pick up our car, etc. So uh, that makes it a lot more enjoyable if you just do it the one way. If you can, as you say, plan the um, uh, the the dropping off of the car or some sort of uh, ferrying situation. Yeah, and remember too that this is a power caching situation. You're not going to be doing even the 10 miles an hour that you might be doing normally on a bike trail because every tenth of a mile you have to stop. You're going to pretty much get on the bicycle, mm -hmm. make a couple of uh, rotations, get off the bicycle, and go find a cache. So it does take a lot longer to find uh, your way to the end of that trail than you might think. Don't, you know, don't expect that it's going to be, uh, you know, the quick speed that you'd uh, see if you were just casually riding, you know, you're yeah. going to have to probably plan on something more like half an hour per mile, and mm. that might even be a little bit generous, depending on the types of caches and terrain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and good indicators are usually mentioned in some of the, the logs, either at the start or the end. People give uh, estimations of their time, so you can use that to sort of extrapolate your own so and that's what we've done you know in the previous cycle we looked at the previous logs and gave us a good indication of how long it's going to take and therefore we can plan the day accordingly yeah now we've been talking mostly about the out and one ways but if you're going to do those out and back trips where you know for the shorter trails or if it's not feasible to stage two cars one of the things that you probably want to look at doing is rather than hitting every single cache hit every other cache so that you hit half the caches on the way out and half on the way back. Now, the problem is if you're doing one of these trails where you have to do every cache and get like a code at the end, that's something that you're not going to be able to do is this uh, mm -hmm. every other cache. But if you alternate caches, it's going to make that trip back so much easier or the trip out because if you're not going to be able to do that uh, Every other cache, generally what I recommend is take the long ride in the morning, you know, as you start the trail and then come back and hit all the caches because it's a lot easier coming back, stopping than, you know, after you've been out for six to eight hours having to make that long ride back. Exactly. How does the getting on and off the bike wear on your body over a day? Uh, I think uh, that's not an issue. I think the, although getting on is probably a, <laughs> the biggest issue. I think <laughs> it's the uh, uh, how can you say your buttocks muscle is uh, gets a fair workout. I think that's the only, uh, in my opinion, anyway. I, I, it is a bit of a pain, uh, particularly if you haven't got a um, uh, stand or something, having to sort of uh, lay down the bike all the time. But um, I guess uh, if you measure that up with uh, walking, we think, hey, <laughs> you're saving a lot then on the ride, so you've got to sacrifice uh, that by handling the bike uh, at the stop and start or refined. Yeah, really the only complaint that I've heard has been those uh, sore bums from all of the uh, riding, and that's yes. not as bad on, you know, the on and off as it would be if you were on the bike the whole time. 
But if you don't have that kickstand, getting the bike up and down, up and down, up and down is going to be quite tiring. And in most cases that I've been in, you generally don't have those nice trees that you can line the, uh, lean the uh, bike against. No. And, yeah. and that's another thing, too, is working with the kickstand in some of those uh, soft dirt situations isn't going to be as easy as you might think. Uh, my tip is find a rock wherever you are and use that to support your kickstand. That's probably going to be the quickest, easiest way to uh, get the bike to stand on its own. Yeah, I, I mean, if you compare it with car power caching, then it's much, much the same, you know, versus opening and closing a door where you're just hopping off and getting on a bike. So it, it's same, a similar amount of effort, really. Uh, it's not. Yeah, uh, though I'll say that I got a lot more sore caching by car getting in and out of the car and you know dealing with the door and uh, the seat and the seat belt and everything that actually made me uh, more sore than getting on and off the bike yeah you're probably more effort depending on how low the car is you know you're lift, lifting yourself up higher whereas getting off a bike is pretty easy really yeah getting on and off the bike is you know just a standard easy motion uh, you know especially uh, if your bike is sized correctly for your body you know, that's going to be uh, uh, quick and easy. Now, that does kind of get to another point of, you know, when you're normally power caching, you have the driver who never gets out of the car. You'll have, like, a navigator who usually stays in the car, and sometimes you have someone who's handling the logging. Maybe that's the navigator, maybe not. But with bicycle power caching, you really don't have those roles. And, and since everyone's on their own vehicle, it, that doesn't really work the same way because you don't have to no. worry about you know anyone staying there. So what we did is pretty much everyone goes to the cache. They get off. They start the hunt. Whoever finds the cache, maybe one or two people stay there to sign and replace the cache. And then the rest of the group will move on to the next one. And then those two will catch up later. So typically everyone will get to see the hide. Mm -hmm. and. Then, you know, whoever was signing that last one, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm moving on to the next one. So you can kind of do a leapfrog kind of system and improve the performance. Not to mention in a lot of those situations, if you have more than two people back there, you know, signing the cash, there's not really enough room for that. So yeah, it, it is a uh, uh, better way for everyone if you don't have everyone sit, uh, sitting around watching someone sign the cash. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I guess most power trails, anyway, the cases typically are easy to find. So there's no real, uh, uh, or this is very seldom that you have to uh, all hunt at the same time. Although occasionally you do, but uh, then they everyone just catches up, so to speak, and then you they all join in. And then uh, as soon as someone finds it, everyone disappears. Uh, or advances to the next one. So, yeah, agreed. Exactly. And you don't want everybody to sign the logs on these caches. No. You know, put a team name, put an event name, something like that. Claim that in your logs that I was part of this group and move on. So it's just one entry on the log. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's always the case with power caching is keep that to a minimum because those logs typically aren't the nice big full-size logs that can mm -hmm. take all those names. Yeah, and another thing I try and do, um, it's not uh, uh, always the case, but I do try and put a, some sort of mnemonic in the field notes when I log the case to, you know, if it's something different or uh, perhaps uh, it was uh, unusual, then uh, it's a memory jogger when you go back and load them in. Uh, you can see the field notes and you say, what does that mean? Uh, I've got no idea. And you completely forget it. <laughs> yeah, at the time, it was a pretty good mnemonic, but <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no, no, you try and try and put something you can uh, really remember, you know, like as high or low or as hard to mm -hmm. find or as an uh, unusual container or something. But, yeah, and for that kind of stuff, I really do like uh, uh, using uh, Geosphere with the templates because I'll go and just template the whole thing it's you know okay this was the first find of the day we're going you know I'll put together a template complete with uh, uh, links for whomever I'm caching with and then I'll uh, be able to right there to go in and do a little note oh and the log on this one is damp and needs maintenance so it really does help to have the uh, smartphone there for that kind of stuff yeah, especially with something like geosphere that's that nice powerful tool 
but on the smartphone thing, uh, this is something else we should probably mention. If you know, when you've got the team splitting up like that, a great tool is Glimpse. Now, Bad Cop, I think you've used this one a little bit too, haven't you? I have, and I think uh, you and I used it together once. When uh, I was late for a show, we were stuck in traffic. Yes, yes. Yeah, and you could see how slow I was moving. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a great tool for all kinds of stuff. Uh, I actually uh, recommended it uh, on the uh, Ingra show that I just did uh, this uh, last Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, Amtrax, have you had any experience with uh, Glimpse? Is that uh, iPhone only, or is that uh, cross-platform? No, it, it's cross-platform. It's uh, iPhone, Android, and I actually learned about it from Android users, so I don't know if it was Android first or not, but it's just a, a great little tracking program where you can send your track uh, live from your smartphone to a web browser or to another smartphone. And the way that I like using it actually with uh, like Ingress is we'll actually set up the group so that we have all of these uh, uh, Glimpse users that we can all track on our apps and watch where everyone is so we know where everyone is at the same time. And that can be really handy when you're out uh, power caching like this because if you wonder, hey, where did we lose these guys? Exactly. Well, you just pull it up and it shows right where they are. And uh, it's kind of obvious sometimes if they went to that... Uh, uh, vault toilet along the trail that they're taking a little bit of a break. <laughs> mm. so, does not uh, latitude do the same thing? Or um, yeah, latitude will yeah. do the same thing. If you're using a Neon Geo, it has a similar tool built in. So there are a bunch of these options, but uh, Glimpse is a cross-platform tool that's got a lot of support and uh, something that you can do. Is, you know, it, if you're using the iPhone, there's also the uh, Find My Friends feature that mm -hmm. will do the same kind of... Uh, well, it won't do the tracks, but it will tell you where people are, so at least you'll be able to uh, find where those go, or, you know, where they are and know where they went kind of thing. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. Is it, it, Something like that really can be handy when you're out in groups like this and are going to be breaking up. Now, another tool I've used with groups is something called Selly. You can set it up on a smartphone. You can set it up on a, in a web browser. Uh, but anybody with a cell phone with uh, tech service, SMS, can use this. So you can send group messages to say, hey, we're going to take a break and meet at this restaurant or this park. Uh, and they can do it all through text, and you can communicate back and forth if you know, you're traveling with somebody who doesn't have a smartphone. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of tools along these lines that uh, you know, maybe we should try to collect and put into a show at some point. And you you know, if, if you're using one of these tools or if you have one similar that you think uh, we should know about, by all means, call those in to us at 206-350-3647 or email us at geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com. And that's one of those times where the email probably works better since you can actually send us the uh, links to the uh, apps or services or whatever. But all of those kind of tools are very, very good for all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you know, I've always kind of thought about using it when I go to a, a theme park with a family. We break mm -hmm. up because, you know, the parents don't want to go on the rides, but the kids do and that kind of stuff. You know, and when you go to those theme parks, things like those uh, FRS radios don't tend to work so well. No, everybody's using them. So oh, that's changed a lot now since everyone has, has cell phones. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. Yeah, you know, uh, changing subjects uh, to other podcasts that I listen to, uh, someone was actually talking about that uh, like five years ago, it was impossible to use FRS radios at any of the Disney parks because everyone had them. And now no one uses them anymore. Everyone's using their cell phones. And unless you have a Verizon service, from what I understand, at the uh, Florida Disney parks, mm -hmm. you're going to have some problems getting uh, service in a lot of locations down there. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, isn't it Verizon that has the Disney app on their service exclusively? They do, and we'll get into it a little bit uh, next week, too. But Verizon also powers the Agent P's World Showcase Adventure. Aha. Uh -huh. So the pieces are starting to fall together. Yes, I think there's uh, some uh, uh, conspiracy, shall we say? There you go. I'm conspiracy always called sponsorship. Yeah, well... Sponsorships, what makes the world go round. Exactly. 
Well, I, I think we've kind of touched on a lot of the uh, overview stuff to give people a good idea of what to uh, look for to try bicycle caching. And we'd love bicycle power caching specifically. And we'd love to hear any stories from anyone who's done it. Uh, Mtrex, do you have any uh, highlights that you'd like to share, though? Um, let me see. The um, I think the uh, one we did uh, around Lake Hume, which is in Victoria near uh, Wodonga, uh, <laughs> Actually, um, the the variety of containers along that route was uh, was quite uh, interesting, and one particular one uh, was a uh, fake snake <laughs> under a log. Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, and you can imagine the reaction you got if you weren't really prepared for that. So, um, uh, is it real? <laughs> <laughs> along those sort of lines. <laughs> exactly. Because it looked pretty realistic to me. <laughs> and it did move a little bit when I lifted up the the log. So, um, <laughs> uh, And I think um, I was uh, bringing up the rear and the other uh, teammates, I think they did find it before me and they uh, thought it was so funny they'd uh, try... <laughs> Tried it on me again. <laughs> so, See, we was, kind uh, of had the opposite experience. We had a, a, a snake that was practically sitting on the cache, mm -hmm. and it was it was not a poisonous snake, and we got all excited. A real one. Yeah, there was a real snake sunning himself. And it's like, oh, everyone's standing around getting pictures with their cell phone, ooing and eyeing, and then you know, a couple of the uh, team members were. Uh, uh, staying back on the trail, well aware of, or well aware of the uh, snake because they don't like snakes. But we were too preoccupied with the snake and didn't want to disturb the snake. And then when the snake moved, oh, there was a cache. Yes. <laughs> what are we here for again? <laughs> well, he was nice. He was showing us right where the cache was. Yeah. There you uh, go. So, so yeah, along that route, they 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 um had uh, highly accurate. Uh, uh, hides and uh, um, that was just one of them. They had a few, uh, you know, like uh, animal uh, themed caches, and uh, some were a little bit harder than others. So it was, uh, you know, variety. You know, was was the, the highlight, I guess. Uh, we I think we had one DNF on that uh, uh, series, uh, which we found out. Uh, it had been moved, so but overall, I highly recommended. We actually spent um, the night at the pub at the far end, um, and then um, you know rode into uh, Wodonga uh, that day. So that was a pretty much a full day's uh, pack packed lunch type of uh, situation. So that was, um, and it was uh, great scenery as well. Uh, beautiful mountains and the lake. So it was. Uh, uh, highly recommended that series and a, a bridge uh, crossing um, had a lot of uh, factors uh, which I think it was about a, over a hundred we found that on that series so uh, quite a you know a large uh, um, number of caches on that uh, particular series ah very cool sounds kind of like a uh, bicycle touring weekend yes yes well we with spent, lots of uh, caches yeah, well, we, so that was a sort of, uh, I guess, uh, maybe four or five hours drive. Uh, so it was definitely a weekend. Uh, so um, we made the most of it uh, getting there and uh, doing the, the day trip and then on the bike. And then once we finished that, we uh, stayed uh, the next day and uh, obviously did some more caching around the area. So that was a great weekend. Nice. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, I got to get into this as well. I'm going to grab my bike. I'm going to fix it up, uh, tune it up this weekend, and start riding it to work. So I'm going to have to grab some caches on the way to and from work, just to. Yeah. Uh, it's just all to practice. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, and, and uh, things. Yeah, some issues you usually have with cars about parking and access. They go away with a bike. I mean takes a little mm -hmm. bit longer to get from A to B, but uh, you're less limited by uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, parking and access in on uh, footpaths and that sort of thing. It's a little bit more uh, easier to get closer to the cache on a bike uh, in general. That's true. Uh, the last time I did bike caching, we went to the uh, Ape Cache here in Washington State. And to get to it, you have to go through a two-and-a-half-mile train tunnel now, this has been a rail-to-trail project, so it's nice and smooth and flat. And, you know, you walk through it in about 
oh, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour, depends on your speed. But you can bike through it extremely yeah. quickly. Really? Yes, exactly. So I was going to say, that's about that, a 10-minute ride for me, if that. Exactly. Well, it, the event, there was a lot of people. I think it took us about 17 minutes. We couldn't get up to full speed with uh, people. Yeah. And it's absolutely dark in there, so you don't ride at the normal you don't ride in the normal <laughs> conditions, so. Oh, we, sure uh, you will. You just have to bring yeah. your big headlamps. You know, I've, I've got the uh, <laughs> couple of four hundred uh, uh, lumen ones I'll bring along, and you know, it, it will be like daylight in there. <laughs> and the bell, the bells, well, ring that liberally as well. <laughs> exactly. No, 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 no. For that, I think you need those, uh, uh, like air train horn kind of things. <laughs> Scare the bejesus <laughs> out of them. <laughs> yeah, there's a light in the tunnel. A light so the horn. What me. is this? <laughs> right. It's a ghost train. <laughs> Yeah. Mtrax, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. It, it's My really pleasure. been a pleasure. Yes, yeah, all mine. Thank, thank you. Yes. Now, next week we're talking with Ricky Briganti about the location games at Disney Parks. So if you have anything that you want to, if you want to ask questions, you want to give feedback, you know, Daryl, why don't you tell them how to contact us? Well, you check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes for this and all of our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206 350 3647, by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com, or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniacs shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniacs shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Oppenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. This show is copyright 2013 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Hey.